following interview was conducted with Professor Al Wright for the Purdue University Law History Program. Uh, it took place on Monday, August 30th, 2007, at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian, and also sitting in his wife class. Welcome. Okay, tell us a little bit about your early years and where you were born and school, oh. etc. I was born in London, England in 1916. My dad was a, a mechanic down there. And in 1923, the things weren't very good in England, and so we immigrated to the United States. Are you getting it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And uh, came to a town of Pontiac, Michigan, where he got a job with General Motors. And uh, I went to school. I had done one year of school in England, and so I started in basically in the second grade in this country. And uh, when I got to junior high, they were starting band and orchestra in the school, so they, I got a French horn, and they, I studied with Dale Harris, who had a very fine high school band, and uh, that's how I got started. And then you stayed, you went to high school in Michigan, right? Pontiac, Michigan. Okay. Yes. And then how did you get to where you go for college? Oh you know, well, how did that uh, come about? How did that come about? Well. I'm trying to think here. Uh, I, I studied, I was pretty good horn player. I studied with a young player from the Detroit Symphony. And the University of Miami was only six years old or seven years old in 1933. They decided if they're going to be a university, they have a football team, a basketball team, a band, and a symphony orchestra. So they came up to Detroit, where there's a wonderful school called Cass Tech. The trains players, and the kids come out of there and go directly into the profession. And uh, my high school band director, Dale Harris, had a contact. So they're looking for French horn players. So I got a penny postcard from this young player I was studying from in Detroit. He said, you have a full scholarship at the University of Miami call. So it was true, so my parents put me on a bus in the middle of the semester, and I got down to Miami. It was very, it was all in one building then, and very young. I was the only horn player. When it came to a football game, I sat next to a sax player. He was wearing a band uniform on top and a football uniform on the bottom. I said, what's the funny getup? He said, well, I kicked the extra points for the football team, but they don't make very many. <laughs> this is the University of Miami. That's so fabulous. <laughs> that was way back, right? That was way back. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, had you graduated from high school when you oh, went down there? Yes, I was. Uh, I graduated. was thinking there's no work to do in those days. In the middle of the depression, I was taking a postgraduate course in the high school, still playing the horn, which is a great help. So I left the high school in the middle of a postgraduate course at the university in the middle of a uh, semester. But they didn't care. They gave me all the credit sure. anyway. Did you live on camp? Tell us a little bit about what, what were some of your activities you were involved in down there. Band and orchestra. Those were my scholarships, and that's what I uh -huh. can't participate in. Now, nobody had any money, so the university gave us one of these make-work projects from the, unit, from the government, PWA, Purdue, Public Works Administration, and there were 14 hours from the Detroit area, all top players. And we all lived in a little Florida wooden house together. It cost about $25 a month, and we all pitched in our $35 a month. We did our own cooking and so forth. We university gave a scholarship, so it all worked on no money. Did very, very economical. Very yeah. economical. Did you, were there any away trips at all, or all local games that you played for the football? Well, we didn't have any money. We I mean, you were playing the band for the I played the band for everything, yes. Okay. Football games. Uh, they weren't playing basketball games. We had no uniforms until somebody gave the university a couple hundred dollars. They gave us sweaters to wear. And uh, we were a very fine concert band. But we were all concert players and very poor marching band. And you say you played the same instrument? Oh, yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Then what was your career path after where? Well, uh, 
I got in, remember I said I got in the middle of a semester and I found out, I took some extra credits, I found out I was going to graduate in December where the rest of these smart guys, these musicians, were going to graduate the next June, all 13 of them. So I thought, well, that's going to make a labor market, you know. So uh, I got out in Christmas, just for Christmas. What year, what year of this? 1937. Yeah, 1937. I graduated, so I walked, uh, as soon as I graduated, I made the, I didn't make an apartment, I just drove over to the uh, biggest high school in town. I said, you guys need a band director? They said, no, got one, and I've got an assistant here. So I went down to see the superintendent of schools. I said, do you need a band director? He said, no, not, not at this point, but I can give you a job, job as a cadet teacher. $900 for nine months, that was $100 a month, which is pretty good. So I went to this little school in Coconut Grove, I helped the principal, I taught the first grade singing, and I collected the lunch money and answered the telephone. But that assistant in the high school couldn't handle the boys, so they had to let him go. The principal said, send that young kid that barged into my office about six weeks ago. Set cadet, right? I get it. They set me over there, and uh, I worked with the director of bands. And the next year, he gave me the marching band because he was tired doing the marching band. And he died in the middle of the year, and they gave me the whole thing. So I taught at Milo Senior High School for 14 years. And I worked it into one of the, it was recognized as one of the top high schools in the country. Did you, took them on any, did you take them on any tours at all? Or? Uh, we used to go to Cuba in those days because Cuba paid all our expenses. Also, I took them to the national contest in Richmond, Virginia, but we had to go by train. We go to state festivals, but uh, no big, no big mm -hmm. tours. I mean, it just wasn't done in those days. What was Cuba like in those, in those days? Great. Uh, Batista was a dictator and everything was clean and everything was crooked. <laughs> Poor people were poor, the people were rich. But they called Havana the Paris of the Caribbean. And then first year married, last time we went down there. Uh, where did you meet your wife? Well, Matt Gladys, I was hired to teach in a band camp. But towards the end of my career in high school, I was doing things out of school in the summertime, teaching a band camp in Colorado, Western Slope of Colorado, Dunstan, Colorado. And that was her first or second year teaching. And so she got a flyer that had a director of bands from, I, from Michigan, Bill Rebellion. She always heard about him. My picture was there too, but she never heard about me. And so she went down. Yeah, we see all the pictures. She, she went from Oregon to Gunston, Colorado, about 1,500 miles, was it? Something like that. We met there. Yes. I rolled in this class. Very good. Good thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then, uh, that first row. Be noticed. First row. Then, very good. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, so then I was teaching in high school, and uh, one day I got a call from a guy. He said, You better apply for a band job at, the, at Purdue University. He said, I hear the guy's leaving there. And I said, well, where's Purdue? He said, I don't know, somewhere up in, in the middle of Indiana. He said, well, this Big Ten. I said, well, what's the Big Ten? He said, well, that's, that's a good football conference, you know. I was way down there in the woods in Miami. So I wrote him. It was a terrible letter. I just thought I would entertain an invitation to join the staff. <laughs> you don't write those kind of letters. No. But fortunately, I had conducted <coughs> a guest the Navy Band in Washington and the Army Band in Washington. And I had taught the summer camps at Florida State University, Stetson University, Idaho State. Well, if this just looks good, you know, on your resume, I can, I can put in the resume. And so about a month later, we got a call to come up here. And um, Glad's and I were in Chicago, and they drove us down to a luncheon. It was quite a luncheon. I, I know now that they had figured if, the, if I would come here, uh, you 
know, they would hire me, but I thought I was just being interviewed. Because President Huffey was at the luncheon table. Vice President Stewart, who was the powerful, sorry, director of athletics, Mackey, director of uh, alumni, F. Ball, and Al Stewart, director of Coco. Well, that was a pretty high, high-priced <laughs> outfit, as you would know, to interview a high school band director for the job. Fortunately, you didn't know the name of the president. I don't think you I never knew the name of any of them. And in fact, I don't know really which one was which from the beginning. But I do remember one thing the president, who I know now, he said, well, Mr. Wright, if we bring you to Purdue, he said, um, what would you plan? What is your plan? I said, well, I've had a good brand in high school. And he said, I said, two things. I love two things. I said, one, I have a good brand. Two, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Speak up. Just budgets, you know. So he laughed. And then at commencement, nine months later, I'm playing. And as the president comes up on stage, he turned, the conductor turns, salutes the president, touches the hat, and he held up two fingers. <laughs> very good. Very good. Backtracking a little bit, what was Miami like at that, that time? Wonderful. Palm, palms all over. You could Were there many around. other schools there, or just the university? There were three high schools. Uh, Miami Edison on the north, and Miami High was the magnet school. And Jackson. And Jackson was the Alapata, was that section right now. Uh-huh. And Carl Gables had his own high school, and uh, Miami Beach had his own high school. Okay. Now your wife came, uh, of course, came with you, and did she? Um, what, what? Did she get something at Purdue? Or? Well, when she came to Purdue. When you came to Purdue, uh huh. Well, you'll have to tell that story, but. It's no, I just drew a circle around Lafayette. Speak up. Yeah, I just drew a circle around Lafayette and I used the job. Mm-hmm. And I found, I found Arvin. They wanted to band program, so I taught there for seven years. What, what was that in? Uh, uh, I taught uh, there for uh, seven years, and then I took that band to Midwest. Midwest. Is and then it consolidated and became Benton Central. And then I took a couple years off, and... Uh, the Klondike band director ran off with the oboe player in the summertime, so they needed another band director. So I decided to that part-time one year, and then I took it for the rest of the six years. And then it consolidated into Harrison, and then I was at Harrison. Okay. Very well, good. Very good. Okay. Keep it. Steady, Dom. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what was, then, what was, um, Tell us a little bit about the All-American Marching Band and how you made changes when well, you know, the first had been here a long time, Yes, right? uh, in fact, Spots Emmerich had had the band for ever since he came here, what was it, 49 years, Gladys? Something like something that. Something like that. And he had a good band. It was a military band, a Roxy band, and they wore band marching for American uniforms. Was so it affiliated with the Roxy? Everybody program? in the band was Roxy. Fact, so it was really a rush. And everybody, all the juniors, excuse me, all the sophomores and freshmen in those days in a, a, a school like Purdue or Glad Grand School had to take Rossi for two years. But if you got in Rossi and got in the band, you didn't have to march around all the time. So you just got to play. And Spots did many good things here. He uh, had a good big band. He had a hundred in the band, which was a marching hundred in those days. was a lot of people. And... Uh, yeah, he used lighted formations at night. He was well known for that. And what well, some of the other things he did? Big were, bass drum. He had the big bass drum. He had that built in 1922. Glocks. And the glocking had a whole row of glockenspiels, bells, you know, which were exciting. He had old fanfare trumpets. He had banners. He really didn't do what the other Big Ten schools were doing, and he didn't care either. <laughs> And so when I came here, of course, I studied his work all summer, and I just took where he had brought it and tried to just just take it farther. Because I remember I took the Army uniform, and the first year of my first fall, I put white spats on, on the band so that their feet would show when they marched. And I put plumes in their hats to make them look taller and get some light up there. And I invited all the high school bands in the state to bring their band here for band day. I started that band day thing where all the band kids. Well, of course, the, the 
I didn't expect that maybe five or six hundred kids would show up, but five thousand kids showed up. And there was a big splash for the new boy on campus, you see. They never had Band Day before, I gather. Never had Band Day before. Because IU doesn't do that sort of thing. We might do it now. And of course, everybody was happy because one of the things you have to do is to bring a high school kid on campus. And uh, the guy, the registrar, called me up the next day, Monday. He said, you know, he did a great job Saturday. He said, you know, we have a whole department on campus. It costs a lot of money. They bring high school kids on campus. He said, you more had more last Saturday than they had all last year. <laughs> what was your first impression, the first game when you walked out of Ross State Stadium? Do you recall that one? Well, yes. But don't forget, I've been doing all my high school shows in, 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 in Miami in the, in the Orange Bowl. Okay. Oh, okay. And, and I've been doing as co-director of the Orange Bowl pageant. You see, so I was used to big stadiums and big crowds. But my first, my first thing with the band was an away game. I thought, well, I'll get, 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 get me and them used to each other at an away game. But it turned out to be Notre Dame. And I didn't realize how important a game that was. And I didn't realize how rude and, and terrible these fans are or how close they are to the sidelines, you know. When they announce the visiting band up there, the whole thing just says boo when you walk on campus. I don't understand. But we brought a, 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 we brought a twirler from, uh, from the West where I was working in Gladys to visit the country produce. So I had a solo twirl. It was Juanita, who Gladys named the Golden Girl. Now, in those days, I, as a, just as a gimmick, I used to, in pregame, I used to dress the girls in the color of the, vision, of the team we were visiting. So she came out in a fluorescent, short, tight, fluorescent costume. Green. Green. So nobody boo. <laughs> I didn't notice. I didn't notice. I was just lucky. See, so that was great. And the in the write up for the football game, I said the only bright thing I think would be the only bright thing at the game last Saturday was Purdue's Torah. She hadn't been named going for it. But that was my first one. The Purdue. That was more of a home crowd. I do remember that the Star Spangled Banner. I had the band blocked, and I had the guy carry out this ladder again, folded it. And I went out, grabbed the two sides, my foot, foot slipped on the first step, and the whole studio went, <gasps> I remember that. Yeah. Never forget that. Interesting. Yeah. You've made a lot of uh, the Golden Girls, and then it's expanded. That you do, did you bring in the flags and the twirlers well, and the other, how uh, the other uh, spots, spots did carry uh, some black and gold flags. And he did carry the one flag for each of the other Big Ten schools. Nobody else did that. So I did that the first game, and then I did got to the end of the season. As part of the flag, I, I, I enlarged the flag core, so I had uh, 40 flags, four, one on each corner of the field for each school, and made them larger, you see. And he had had some twirlers here, three twirlers. They wore long trousers, and I shortened those down. Skirts <laughs> and later to Leotards. First year of Didn't you recall skirts. something with that they noticed that short skirt and someone called it? Was it Helen Schleeman that what was that story you recounted before? That Helen oh, called? I did a I did a show, a Hawaiian show, and the girls went out in uh, in what do you call it? Grass uh, skirts. Grass skirts. The fuck I or something. They didn't want it, you know. And uh, uh, I had about a dozen girls in the this is a, the halftime show? Yeah, halftime show. So, well, uh, Helen got there some complaints from some of the female faculty, you know. So I went over to see her, and we talked for a while. I said they were very modest. I, she said, just, I said, don't forget that it's the state. It was a folkloric costume. <laughs> she said, well, I can't argue that one. So. About six months later, she's doing the spring spring. She also always did a spring cocktail party. We were invited. Guess who answered the door? Helen Schleeman. Guess what she was wearing? A grass skirt. <laughs> 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 Which she took off for me. 
Uh, one another thing that we talked about, uh, that the NBC radio show with the Band of America, that uh, you did, did it with... Um, Paul of Allen. Uh, with uh, Paul of Allen. Well, I was terribly lucky that first year. All those kids showed up for banding. <coughs> and uh, I, with Rochdy, I invited the Army Band director, who I knew, to guest conduct part of the program. Sure. My first symphony band concert. I invited the Marine Band director, who I knew from Washington, to do my second concert. And I used Paul Laval in Miami to conduct the All-State Band, which I had organized down there. And it was NBC. They claimed it was a very popular show. They claimed 60 million people tuned into the Band of America. Paul well, Laval was the conductor. Sunday night, yes. And well, maybe 40 million, but not 60. And so he said, sure, I'll come down. So he came down, guess what? We announced it, and as soon as the announcement went out, and I didn't know it, the president of city service who sponsored the whole thing was a Purdue graduate. How lucky can you get? See? So he said, well, if I'm paying for their broadcast, my band's going to play it. See? And so they worked out a deal with the union, so they played one tune from the NBC studio. Yes. You know, now we take you to my, to my yeah. Well, as soon as it was, I would always worry when I first came here about all those 6,000 seats in the uh, Elliot. Uh, Elliot Hall of Music, which is a magnificent place to play. Well, as soon as Paul of Al was going to be, we was just going to be, they said, we got to print, print free tickets. So they print free tickets, 6,000 of them. They were all gone from the box office in three days. We had an overflow crowd. The president got the interview with Mike Ireland, the president of city service, on a national broadcast of the intermission. How lucky can you get? Super. That's really nice. Yeah. Well, how did you, um, did the band increase in size? What were some of the other things that you brought along? Uh, one of the things I Also, found, they, were you involved with the Silver Twins and the Girl in Yeah, I started the Silver Twins. I had a couple of girls show up. Uh, I, had, I didn't have twins in that high school. I had a, a duo back there. And a couple of girls showed up who happened to be twins about the second year, I guess it was. Guys can correct me on this. And I had to go and girls, so I put them in silver suits and said, okay, throw them together, you know, how lucky to get twins. Well, what I didn't know, I soon had a line of twins waiting to come in here and turn out this. <laughs> a couple of times we didn't have any twins that were good enough, so I had lookalikes. But the Golden Girl was first, and then the, the girl's line came in later. Well, that wasn't, I had a terrific girl come on campus, and but I already had a commitment to another girl who had been there one year. So I said, well, you got, she wanted to come. I said, well, this girl graduates in one year. you got to wait around one year. And then I think Gladys or someone said, put her in a black costume. So she went out in a black costume. It was pretty, really better than the Golden Girl, you see. And that started the girl in black. I had a line of girls lined up with the audition for a girl in black. Yeah, that's quite a big tradition. It's nice. Well, yeah. You know, we never found a real black. <laughs> you know, did you start the um, alumni band that comes? With yes. Uh -huh. That I make a comment, having sat in the stands for some of us, it's interesting the view the people watch and they think it's just amazing that they can those old guys can, those old guys can, and the, and the, 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 the twirlers oh, and everybody yeah. can really you know it, it, they're blown away yeah. it, it, it goes over very well oh we had one gal she came back she's been with us 25 years ago she was about 49 how old was she when she came in from California who? Jim? no the other one first why one. why he was 60 she came down, she was 60 years old. Put on her suit, wow, that's Did right. still fit? <laughs> yeah, she, she made sure. Yes, yes. And, of course, she had a few wrinkles. But the camera followed her around, the news followed her around. She was the hit of the she show. She was the end of the day, right? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, in the, did you have any assistance? Uh, how did you build well, your budget? Well, budget, it was always budget, you see. And remember, I told the president, finger or two, it was going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. So, the second year, they gave me a second year. This is my professor didn't have one. And the third year, I had an assistant. And the second year, I got an assistant. McCamber. McCamber. McCamber, who was uh, from Stetson University in Florida. I knew him. I knew his work. So he came here. Right. Then the third year, I got one graduate assistant. And they have, I think, I had five when I left. 
but uh, because the program was growing, and I was getting to that Spots Hell audition. And it's every gosh, year you had to you every year them? Spots Spots, mm -hmm. not yeah. I, yeah. had auditions for the band, and it was tough. And everybody was shaking and come in and lock kids and say, "Hell, I'm not going to do it. I'm not good enough," you know. And he, he was pretty rough on kids, that, he, and you were supposed to be rough on kids in those days, you know. And the kids just hated those auditions. So what we said, I said, you're welcome to the band. Join the band, then we'll listen to you play, and we'll find a place for you to play. Marching band, concert band, second band, we didn't call them that. But we found a place for every kid to play without an audition. Now, after the marching system, who was going to get in the symphony band? Then we did have auditions. But I knew them, they knew me, they were comfortable. And those that knew that they really weren't good enough didn't show up. So to get uh, an 80 piece symphony band, I'd probably have 140 show up. So I still had a lot sure. of right. yeah. You expanded, so when you first came, it was just a marching band, or did they have any other? They had the, the they had Lee the Club, of course. Didn't well, they? that was Al Stewart. That was yeah, I know that's that different, was, but I'm talking about any kind of musical. They, they had the band. Okay. And it was a military band, and they did everything. It, it uh, went out on call on Veterans Day. It uh, played football games. Uh, it, and then after that, it became the concert band. It became the concert band. Okay. And, some kids, and then you got the symphony band that came? Well, that's what I started. Okay. Because that was symphony band concert band. So you have levels there, like symphony orchestra. So and the, the program was growing very quickly because you didn't have to audition, and uh, we got a lot of ink on the, the the new things we were doing with the flags and the twins and the Golden Girls. So people knew about the band, yeah. and then of course the Paul Laval broadcast nationwide. All the mommies and daddies said, "Well, if we go to Purdue, maybe I'll hear my kid on the radio <laughs> or see him on TV." <laughs> exactly. One of the, the things, of course, you were, the race, you were, the crew bands always participated in Indy 500. Oh, yes. You get some involvement in that, too. Yes, they told me when I came here. It was in no, my, right. it was in my uh, they told me at that luncheon that I would be expected to uh, to take the band to the 500. Had it gone before you came? It had one? always gone for oh. 20, 30 years. Okay. You know, it was the thing, it was the first, it led everything around me. He did all the ceremonies at the Purdue band. Yeah, Purdue band. And uh, on a sideline on that, the day we got a letter announcing that I was hired at Purdue, it was in April, late April, early May, Gladys and I went out to dinner in Coral Gables to celebrate. We went across the street to go to a movie afterwards. We walked in, going down the aisle, the newsreel was on, and here was the Purdue band marching towards me as a, what we call a, a bumper for the, uh, for the five no. mile race. Boy, <laughs> but that first, the, you know, when you raise your baton, you're gonna be, you've got to play, the band plays taps first. And they, the, the minister first, of course, reads, uh, they have a minister down there, Catholic, because Tony Holm was Catholic. He had the prayer in his hand, and his, his hand was shaking, you know, I thought, maybe God's not with him anymore today, maybe he's with me instead. <laughs> I was scared to death. <laughs> I was afraid the stars sprang a bear. And Dinah Shore was my, was my uh, soloist. Not mine. It was Tony Holmeson. But it was my job to do the Back Home Again in Indiana with her. I called her ahead of time. She sent me her arrangement with the rehearsal. And everything. Well, I remember I said, uh, we were up there at Microphone Call. I said, uh, Miss Shore, I'll follow you. Oh, she said, no, my so I will follow you. She was correct. Of course. She loved that's kind of that's kind of neat. And you still been going? They still go every year. Every year we went. They're still going. Did you meet Tony Holman? Yes, I became his director of music for the whole race. Uh, after about three, four years, he and I got along very well. What were some of the changes? Did you expand on it, or? Uh, I, I uh, you know, everybody wanted to march down there, so Tony was having. A uh, big anniversary coming up. He said, do you think we could get a few more bands out? I said, get as many as you want. He 
says, well, you know, he says, it's the 50th anniversary of the race. I said, I'll get you 50 bands. He said, great. Well, I got 53 just in case somebody counted them, you know, and somebody didn't show up. And, uh, but I, I, I did, and uh, I used to stop and find and do some twirlers, I had some twirlers and things like that. But it was very sacrosanct because, you know, a woman could never, was never allowed to step foot on the speedway, on the bricks. Unlucky. Of course, after I saw those twirlers go by, that broke the rule. <laughs> and Notre Dame, no woman was ever on a football field. But my major, out there in Gladys. Gladys yeah. What was this with Notre Dame? And they well, were, yeah. Yeah, on the back of the ticket it says, no women or dogs on a football field. Really? Yeah. 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 And Notre Dame. Notre Dame, yes. Yeah, they had to let the girls. That's what was a long boys school. And they had to let the girls in, so you know, I said, well, let stay in the middle of the last lane, he said, and you'll get in. See, and I had a flowing cape, and I was right in the middle of the black lane, and somebody grabbed my cape. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got in, my hook was ripped. That's interesting, I didn't have to know that. Please, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's yeah. uh, they, they have the pep band, that, that started after you. Uh, a pep band is, uh, is a, a bunch of guys who get together for one occasion only. Uh, uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> like uh, if they're having a big basketball, they didn't have a game, but have a big basketball uh, tournament or playing without you or something. Sure. We get a special group together that could read names so they can play, play music, play the IU song and stuff yeah. like that. So, Tell me about going to the, you went to the Rose Bowl, you took the band, they went? Oh, yes. Uh, the library has many pictures of the... Oh, uh, yeah, of uh, that. The, uh, you had to go by train, did you? I didn't have to, but oh. I did. 1967, and every year up until then, guys says, I hope we win, I hope we go to the Rose Bowl. Because fortunately, I'd had from 54 to 67 to get the band really in top shape, you know, grow, get all that stuff going. If it had been too early, it wouldn't have been nearly as much fun. So Mackie, always said, Red Mackie, he says, if we ever go to the Rose Bowl game, I'm going to take your whole band. I said, it's getting bigger every year. He says, I'll take the whole band. Don't worry about it. Now, they, the bands used to uh, travel by train in those days. And uh, every year, all the Big Ten band directors got a visit from the Pacific Railroad and from another rail there. Wabash. Wabash, Wabash Railroad. And they uh, would separately talk to him, give him a calendar, just in case that particular school went. Well, so I got, had my two visits, I had my two calendars, and said, no, I'm going to Rose Bowl. I got two kids trained. So I called both guys, and I said, can you be in my office at 10 o'clock next Saturday morning? Yes, sir, I'll be here. And I called the other guy. I said, can you be in my office at 10 o'clock next Saturday morning? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. So they both got in, they looked at each other, and they, you know what I'm saying? I said, if one of you guys get this big contract, the other guy will get nothing. I want one of you to take me out, and the other railroad to bring me back. And they both bought it right away. Super. Did they do a job? They gave us, each one gave us our best diners. Every di our menu was printed for the Purdue band, four color and all that. And they took the instruments as well. Huh? Well, you had it. It was a strange train, you know. There's a couple of locomotives, and the staff had a sleeper up front, and we had the chair cars. And then we uh, had the dining cars, and no sleeper cars in the suits. And in the back, we had an instrument uh, car. And then the big drum would only go through a freight car entrance. So on the very end of the train, we had a freight car, you see, so we could put the big drum in. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and our train was going backwards. I thought, oh, we're, we're going to get there this way. And it was stopping all the time. Finally, the conductor says, the hookup between a freight car and a passenger car doesn't stay together very well. So he said, finally, I just got out and got some wire clippers and cut down a piece of a farmer's fence and made, a piece, made me a hook that held it together. I didn't hold the train. It stopped at far in the parks. We stopped in Denver and prayed it. It was six degrees. We did anyway. We stopped in uh, uh, Salt Lake City at 11 o'clock at night and so that the kids had wanted to go out and see the, uh, the Mormon stuff. 
uh, is where they go to service training, water and stuff like that. And we stopped in Las Vegas, paraded up and down the street, Fremont Street only in those days. And somebody sent me a paper later, it said, headline on the paper, it said, the only thing that took, that has ever called the gamblers away from the slot machines was the Purdue band marching up and down the street. So I got that perfect in my book. <laughs> Save that one. Right. And nice, cute little story. The sheriff, they let us open up the sheriff's car and came back and said, I see you're the director of the band, because I don't pray for the He said, I said, yeah, I'm the director. He said, so are you kids uh, are over 18? I said, yes. He said, you know, the gambling limit here is 21. He says, I don't want to see a single one of your underage kids in, in town. He said, by the way, I just got a call. I'll be out of town for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're having a good time. <laughs> Each day was a fun-filled day. Yeah. And then, uh, what did you say? Did they enjoy being out there at the road? Did you? Oh, it was a marvelous experience, you know. They come back took a train, and we stopped the train, took on a spur line, took it right up the Grand Canyon, right up to, right up. Wonderful. Did you come back the same route, or? No, we went, we went out through Denver and came back through Albuquerque. Oh, to, okay, the southern route. To railroads, to completely oh, that's to railroads. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a battle right. thing for the, um, were there any other changes that, uh, did you ever have problem getting people in the band, or you've always had enough, you think? Well, uh, I never always had enough. Okay. Of course, any band director, if you got more people, you'll find something for them to okay. do or expand. Okay. You see. No, I never. Uh, we, I always worked at getting the best players I could because uh, a very fine player graduating from high school would, would usually think first of IU or Michigan or Illinois where he can continue to study. Study music. Study music. But in Peru, if they, if they came and sang, they sang in the Glee the Club, which was better than most college Greek clubs. Right. And uh, if they came, they played in my symphony band and had a much happier experience than if they were with the, in a college of music where they had to play certain compositions by certain composers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. so. And then you uh, expanded as far as uh, male and female, too, over time. Well, yeah, Goddess was pushing me on that pretty high. Well, Peru all the big things. Yeah. 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 Do they, uh, on the alumni band, how do you get the people, uh, who handles getting these people to come uh, We put out a mailing. One of the, one of the assistant directors that does that work for you. I thought it used to be every year, but I think it's every two, or was it always every It used to be every year because we didn't get very many people oh, or something okay. new. And we didn't have all that many alums, you see. So we just sent out a letter, we're going to have an alumni band, and we put them out there, and they played not very well didn't do any marching. They got to the point where not the first game they did. Oh. They just stood, stood playing. You've got, you've got all the bowls, correct? You, the band has gotten has got all the bowls, most of them? Well, they went to five, five, four minor bowls, quote, in the Rose Bowl. Sure. I think they've gone about all of them now. Yeah, that's, that's pretty nice. Well, there are 50 bowls, I understand, by the most cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they did all the major bowls, yes. Yeah. That uh, American, I am an American speech, how did that come about? Uh, that was during the, the days when the kids were picketing and having all sorts of trouble. And then we had a the guy that ran the Journal Courier, and I forget his name, I should remember. He was a, he was a hard fisted, all American type of guy. And he called me up and he said, Al, we got to do something with these kids, a football game. He said, I want something, something patriotic out there at the pregame. Can you do that? It wasn't a command. I said, sure, I'll do it. So I took, I sat down, and I, I, I found a poem that I could change around quite a bit. And I used, I, uh, America the Beautiful is the background, the band that played that very So I write the, wrote this thing, I Am an American. See? And uh, I had a wonderful guy, reader, Jack Carroll, was from the theatrical department. He did my announcement for me. He did a wonderful job that first time. And he said, I am an American. And uh, it was nice, and everybody thought it was great. So the next week I didn't do it, because I liked to do something. And all hell broke loose. <laughs> the kids, the kids, uh, student body said, we want that back in. Of course, we had a very happy journal courier who wrote some very nice editorials. And so the third game we put it in, and it's never been since. Yes, it is, it's nice. It really yeah. has a nice thing. Every 
got a couple of little honors. You got the you got a Sagamore of the Wall. That's how to do oh, your reaction. Oh, Stuart Conker got me that one. Well, you're always very pleased when you get something like that. And uh, uh, I know it's a very important award, and a lot of my very important friends like Hubby and people like that have gotten this award. So she had put my name into the legislature, and they approved it. I was very proud of that. How did, you, uh, did they give you a call? Is that how it worked? Did you, they have oh, a Sheila gets the call. A legislature may, may nominate somebody from her or his district. So okay. It has to be approved by the legislature and signed by the governor. Okay, okay. And then you got the uh, Sousa Memorial, the Medal of Honor from the Sousa. Sousa. Are you Sousa. still involved in that foundation? That yes. Okay. In fact, right now we're working, trying to organize a band for New Orleans. We're having trouble getting an all-American band from each state to go down there because the parents don't want to send their kids to the ones or have any problem. Yes, I organized the John Philip Sousa Foundation. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, of course, John Philip Sousa is our patron saint, you know, and we have the, uh, we have a, a, a Bandmasters Association, and this fellow up in Chicago, he was a realtor named uh, Louis Sudler. He was a millionaire. I think he had, he never told me how many millions he had, I never asked. In those days, it was probably only about 60 or 70. He said, yeah, he says, I'm a millionaire. He said, but I got a friend that's really rich. He's got 250 million. Those <laughs> well, were the days before billionaires, you know. But, but he liked, see, he liked high school bands. And so he said, come up with a program. And so I called it the Sousa, the, the John Philip Sousa Foundation, and we started this all-American high school band. Two kids from every state play in Washington, take the kids to Washington for a week. We play half the concert in the United States Marine Band, we play the other half. And he gave me uh, uh, $600,000, he gave me $300,000, which was not to spend the income from that. And that was how we got some. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yes. And you're still doing that? Yes, and he came up 